for my first video of 2018, I wanted to look at the thought process in how to better inform people who are either misinformed or uninformed. Now, this is something that I try to do throughout my videos. I'm not perfect, but I try to inform people in a way where they're not turned off if they don't agree with me. Because I think that is a, it's an issue that a lot of us face when trying to talk to people who are not politically aligned with us. How do we talk to people who don't agree with what we're saying? Or who, it, it, in many cases, are misinformed on issues. And they believe their misinformation and aren't open enough to hear the other side and what might actually be going on. So this is a, this article in Alternet sort of set me off to this. So this is titled, Trump supporters are far more likely to read and share fake news online. On 289 such sites, about 80% of bogus articles supported Trump, the Times quoted the study. In fact, the far right, approximately 10% of the sample, made roughly 65% of visits to site that published more than two stories that were false. So a lot of people will read these numbers and see, wow, 80% of bogus articles are supportive of Trump. But the way I see these numbers is only 10% of their sample, which is the far right, make up 65% of the readership of those articles. So the vast majority of people reading these fake news pro-Trump articles are a small minority of people on the far right. Now, I do think that we shouldn't just completely discount these people. I think we should still try and inform these people. But you have to realize that the vast majority of people are gettable in a sense where it's a lot easier to inform them than it is to inform the the 10 percent of far-right trump supporters so when you look at it that way you can better frame your message to really relate to these people who they may not be complete die-hard trump supporters and really they're just misinformed on the issues now Saying that, it's important not to approach the discussion by name-calling or by using emotion to set those people, uh, to put them in the corner and make them afraid of engaging with you. So, there is something called the backfire effect. Now, the backfire effect is an aspect of psychology. When an opinion is contradicted by the facts, instead of the opinion changing, it gets further strengthened. Now, there is a dispute about how many people actually are affected by the backfire effect because I, like many people watching this video, I'm sure, have changed their opinions on issues over the years. So the idea that we all want to stick to our long-held beliefs is flawed because people do change, people do learn, and people do go from being conservative to being a progressive. It happens, and it happens a lot. So the the point of bringing up the backfire effect is that really what, what matters here is how you communicate your argument, whether you use emotion or whether you simply stick to the facts and let the person make their own minds up, whether they want to agree with you or not. If you keep bringing in the actual, uh, the reality of what's going on, and you keep bringing these arguments up over and over again, Eventually, they can and they do stick. It may not happen initially, but it can happen over time. And that's why it's important to be cognizant of how you come off to people when you're trying to change their minds on something that they may have ha had a long-held belief on. So The Guardian actually breaks down a few examples of where this has worked, where, where people have been able to actually change their minds because of the way that they've been informed. So in the UK, the reduction in drink driving, or what I call drunk driving, between 1979 and 2009 is estimated to have saved thousands of lives. Legislation and enforcement were combined with sustained investment in public communications that worked with, not against the ways our brains process information and make decisions. The campaign countered our tendency to see drunk drivers as different, as drunks meaning drivers failed to see their own behaviors as part of the issue. It connected the issue and its consequences to familiar actions and scenarios, 
forcing people to see the relevance to themselves. So I think what stands out here is the language. So instead of seeing drunk drivers as drunks, the language around the campaign was more about the consequences of the scenarios that come from drunk driving. Now, when I was reading this, I was reminded of Portugal. So when Portugal decriminalized all drugs, part of the process of that was this societal shift of changing the language around drug addicts. So drug addicts used to be called drogados, which was a slang term that essentially meant druggies. So by changing the language from drogados to now treating addiction issues as people with addiction issues, it now made those people feel like they were actually a part of society and that they could actually get the help they needed to change their behavior. Now, this next part, or this next example from The Guardian, focuses on the U.S. and LGBT issues. LGBT campaigners in the U.S. shifted their language from emphasizing gay rights to talking about love and relationships. This highlighted our shared humanity, values, and connections to society's institutions. It made the issue one that people could identify with rather than argue against and distance themselves from. So what stands out to me here when trying to form an argument is the connection on an emotional level. So by focusing on shared experience, you can better form your argument by connecting with that person. So for example, if somebody thinks that the Mexicans are to blame for their low pay, then you can, you can relate to that person by understanding that you are correct to be angry that you're not being paid as well as you should be. But then you can then introduce information showing them that, that look, all the gains from, since early 1980s have gone to the top 10%. And discuss how, how, how could Mexican people, people who have no power, immigrants who have no power in this situation, how could they negatively affect your bottom line when the people that do have the power that are buying off these politicians are now changing the laws in their favor to benefit them financially. Isn't that more, isn't that an argument that makes more sense than people who have no power taking over your paycheck? So when you better, when you're able to connect with somebody on that emotional level by understanding that yes, your frustration is correct, but the outlet for where your frustrate for where your frustrations are being put may be incorrect, then you possibly open that person up to changing their mind. Now, again, this is something that is not going to happen on a first or second try. But the more you build these arguments and the more you show them the actual data, then there's a better chance that they will at one point or at some point change their mind and be informed by the information you're giving them. Now, this last example is about uh, smoking in the UK. In just three years, the proposal to ban smoking in public places in the UK went from being seen as controversial and extreme to an accepted reality. Once again, a deliberate and evidence-based use of language was key to persuading policymakers and members of the public to back this move. A new story was told in which secondhand smoke was the bad guy, leading people to blame the system, not individuals. So reframed in terms of unsafe public space, better regulation became the sensible solution. So for me, this really highlights why I focus on the system more than I do on any certain individuals. So when you focus on the system being broken, and here's how we can fix the system, for example, money in politics, then you can actually work towards a real solution rather than just putting anger and blame at certain individuals. So while, for example, the Koch brothers are worth discussing, you have to underpin it, uh, underpin that by focusing on what the actual problem is. And the problem is that they are able, that the Koch brothers are able to buy off politicians, not necessarily that the Koch brothers are immoral. It's that they have the ability to affect the system to benefit themselves. It's a systemic issue. So when you focus on the system, it's a lot more effective than focusing on any one person. Now, there are, I came across these, these six, um, I guess you could say examples or six ways to 
communicate to people effectively, that doesn't turn them off. So I'm going to go through these six, and I think this is a good guideline to go by. Number one, keep emotions out of the exchange. Number two, discuss, don't attack. Number three, listen carefully and try to articulate the other position accurately. Number four, show respect. Number five, acknowledge that you understand why someone might hold that opinion. And number six, try to show how changing facts does not necessarily mean changing worldviews. Now, I think the first five of those are self-explanatory, but the sixth one I want to dive into a little bit. So try to show how changing facts does not necessarily mean changing worldviews. Now, what this means is you can introduce somebody to the actual, to real information, to the facts, without forcing them to feel like they have to change their entire philosophy. So, for example, uh, money and politics. So money in politics, politicians being bought off by large corporations and by the wealthy is not a left or right issue. It's just an issue. It's an issue with how politics is done. We all want our politicians to represent us and they don't represent us if they're answering to their big donors. So you can explain that in a way where, look, this is the real issue. Money in politics is the real issue. But you can explain that and show that you don't need to be a progressive in order to acknowledge that money in politics is an issue. It's okay to be a conservative and still realize that that is the main, it, that is the main problem. So people get caught up in, in these labels. You, ha like you have to be a progressive or you have to be, uh, if you're in favor of getting money into politics, then you, you have to be a progressive. No, I don't think you do. You can label yourself whatever the hell you want to label yourself, but understand what the actual issues are. And that's why I try to focus on the issues, on the policy, and discuss what is the, what's the current problem with whatever's happening and discuss the policy that might fix that. So in healthcare, I try to discuss, look, the U.S. is the only country in the world that doesn't have, that doesn't guarantee healthcare to all its people. And the solution to that is a Medicare for all system. Medicare is highly rated by the people that use it. So to now apply that to everybody, I think is a sensible solution and to not rely on private industry who look to make a buck off sick people. I think that is that that doesn't need to be a left or right issue. You can agree with Medicare for all and not necessarily call yourself a progressive again. These are just labels. So to sort of summarize it all, when we focus on the actual issues and the solution to the issues and don't focus on individuals, then we get closer to a society that may actually represent us.